Go read his citations. This is Brian from Mac Play Studios, and I am back. I have been on something of a sabbatical, doing IRL stuff like work and classes for licenses to get me more work. That makes me all the more surprised at just how many new faces appear to be here. In which case, welcome, all of you. Thanks for subscribing. I plan on actually having content for you for once. So, to celebrate the channel returning from extinction, let's talk about a relatively ancient show about a similar topic. For 30 years ago, the first source material for Power Rangers, Kyoryu Sentai Judanger, premiered on TV Asahi. Running from February 21st, 1992 to February 12th, 1993, Kyoryu Sentai Ranger, literally Dinosaur Squadron Beast Ranger, was the 16th installment of the long-running Super Sentai franchise. This season has a dinosaur and fantasy theme as the titular Jew Rangers do battle against the evil witch Bandora and her various monsters. The show does depict these events, but I hesitate to say the show focuses on the Jew Rangers that much at all, but... We'll get to exactly why later. Starting with aesthetics, the suits are simple yet elegant. Anyone wondering about why the OG Power Rangers had diamonds on their suits could look to Jew Ranger, as they give off a knightly or tribal feel. One could argue that they could be fangs, but I don't see it. The helmets are the heads of each Guardian Beast, with their mouths becoming visors. The Guardian Beast designs are well executed, realized through good old fashioned models and costumes. The combined form, which averts everyone as a limb for red syndrome, has two modes a Dino Tanker mode that's used about twice in the whole show, and Daijujin, an incarnation of the tribe's god. Daijujin, better known by his western incarnation as the original Dino Megazord, is a timeless design that properly evokes an image of a warrior deity, which is quite appropriate seeing how he behaves. Yes, I said behaves, we'll get to that later. Bandora looks like this, hardly a design that strikes fear into people, but it's fine for demonstrating that she's completely insane. Her generals aren't particularly scary either, but they each have their own memorable design, split evenly between those that show the actors' faces and those that do not. Jew Ranger was the first show in a while at the time to have more extensive mecha battles, lasting longer than just attack, attack, finisher. The fights are entertaining and well choreographed, and the effects mostly hold up. Just ignore how Daijujin's hand shrinks when he has to hold a sword, or how many Guardian Beasts or mecha become their toys during certain still shots. Everyone that isn't an extra or a kid of the week does reasonably well with acting, with Majiko Soga's Bandora stealing the show with her manic behavior. The music in general is not great. There's too much generic rock music for what's supposed to be a fantasy show during the normal fights. The score only adds in the orchestra during mecha fights to emphasize the stakes. The OP, which I can't show too much of lest YouTube get mad at me, is a microcosm of this problem. It's very generic and tame for a dinosaur show, though it's mildly catchy, I suppose. The ED is a silly reggae tune that always seems to kill the mood of more dark episodes. <laughs> While none of the inserts stick out, Bandora and her flunkies have a dance that plays in three separate episodes that... actually kinda slaps. Our story begins with Japan sending its first space shuttle, holding a few astronauts and two children to explore planet Nemesis. How a space shuttle is supposed to take off again is up for debate, but whatever. Two of the astronauts investigate some sort of container, opening it to reveal the Bandora gang. They thank the astronauts for releasing them from their 170 million year sleep by blasting them, stealing the shuttle, and announcing their presence to Earth. Bandora flies through the air on a bicycle, declaring her hatred for humans and children in particular. This old guy named Barza recognizes the threat and takes an elevator down thousands of levels to an ancient base where he unlocks the stasis chambers of the Jew Rangers. Literally, he unlocks them each with keys. Out from the chambers come Goshi the Wise, Boy the Quick, Mei the Caring, and Dan the Brave. That's most of their character analysis right there, just so you know. The Red Jew Ranger's key breaks, so the first four must rescue the kids from getting crushed inside their shrunken shuttle. Red's guardian beast Tyrannosaurus blasts Red's door open, allowing Geki the Just to wake up from stasis and assist the others. They eventually transform using their dino bucklers into the Kyoryu Sentai Jew Ranger and fight some foot soldiers, the Clay Golems. They get close to saving the shuttle, but a giant monster steals it away. Bandora sends out her first monster of the week, created by her servant Pleprechaun, who fights the Jew Rangers for a while until their weapons break. 
Our heroes eventually recover the shuttle, and Geki fights the giant from the last episode with the Guardian Beast Tyrannosaurus. Notably, the show takes its time setting up some of its elements. The Jew Rangers have to go on a quest to get their legendary weapons that combine into the Howling Cannon. The main mecha, Daijujin, isn't formed until episode 6, which is oddly placed between the antics of this riddle-loving sphinx monster. After that, though, it's strictly formula for a bit, which would be perfectly fine if each of the episodes either advanced the overall plot or developed our leads, but more often than not, the show leans on its own formula. The Kid of the Week. You know, that was a typo when I was typing the script, but I think I'm gonna keep it. Take the normal Super Sentai formula and make it so that the victim is almost always a child. Fine, makes sense here, Bandora hates children so it's logical for her to want to torture them. It can even dip into the adult fear of seeing one's own child in danger. Now, have a new kid every week and have an arc written for them in lieu of developing the characters in the spandex instead of having, say, a small recurring group of kids that develop alongside the heroes. Now have them devoid of any level of common sense, particularly in the Stranger Danger department. Now, and this is the most important part, whenever they're in danger, mild or grave, make them shout in the most monotone, unenthusiastic manner, TASKETE! Taskete is the te or command form of taskedu, which means to help. Taskete simply means help me or save me, so it's not like the phrase doesn't make sense in these contexts, and the subtitles do have that correct. But for crying out loud, did nobody tell any of these kids to act like they mean it? The kids find themselves in some pretty messed up situations, admittedly, yet they're crying for help with the same gusto as greeting their teacher in the morning at school. Exceptions exist, of course, but remember, Bandora hates children, so this is the formula for Jew Ranger, so you'll hear Tazkete so damn often, you might find yourself going, maybe she has a point. On top of all that, though, these kids get more screen time and development than the actual Jew Rangers who don't grow or change much throughout the show, despite none of these children ever returning for episodes beyond their debut. That's not to say there's no overarching plot, both factions are after a pair of dinosaur eggs. The Jew Rangers and Guardian Beasts want them so the dinosaurs can avoid extinction after Bandora killed most of them in ancient times. Bandora wants to destroy them and cause said extinction. This results in a back and forth where kids, either bystanders or royalty, mess things up and cause them to get lost again. This plot doesn't come up very much until the end, and you think that any time a bad guy gets a hold of the eggs, they just smash them in seconds, but they never seem to think of that for some reason. Some world building is sprinkled throughout the show, often through passages from the literal story bible that explains how certain monsters weren't just created by Bandora but came from ancient times, often causing problems for one of the tribes the Jew Rangers hail from. This does mostly manifest as exposition for how to defeat a monster, but it still does show that some thought was put into the show's backstory beyond Pleprechaun made this monster. A few recurring allies appear here and there, like Gnome, the snarky associate of Barza's that helps the Jew Rangers at times and isn't afraid to murder his own son to prevent him from summoning a certain spoiler character, the hell? Now, this is the part where I have to go into spoilers. I imagine most of you already know what's coming, but here's the time code if you want to watch the show for yourself and skip to my final score. I'll say this ahead of time. The show does get a bit better as it goes on, focusing slightly less on Kids of the Week and more on the heroes and villains, but it still never reaches the heights that it could reach. Episode 17 marks the debut of Budai, the older brother of Geki and better known as Dragon Ranger, the first recurring sixth hero. Dragon Ranger takes a standard Jew Ranger design and adds gold trim and gold chest armor. He looks solid, no complaints there. He starts out antagonizing the team, Geki in particular, because of a dispute between their adoptive and biological fathers, which left the biological father dead, so Budai fled the tribe and swore revenge on Geki, the heir to their tribe's throne. Bandora takes advantage of this and gives them the sword powered by hatred. This, along with an elaborate plan to destroy Daijujin, puts the Jew Rangers on the ropes for a whopping five episodes. He's one of the few causes for the Jew Rangers to lose in an episode where it's not even close to the finale. Of course, Geki eventually gets through to him, but Ai's evil sword is destroyed and he lends his Jusokin flute dagger and his own guardian beast, Dragon Caesar, who's basically Mecha Godzilla right down to the missile fingers, to the side of justice. All this awesomeness comes with a price, though. Budai was already killed in his own stasis during the Ice Age, but a spell made by this kid, Clotho, resurrected him on Daijujin's orders. Because of the nature of the spell, Budai's remaining lifespan is cut down to only 30 hours, depicted by a green candle. The chamber in which he resides a lot of the time prevents him from aging, but only when he's inside. If he leaves for any reason, the countdown resumes. Hence, Budai is only seen in the show in short bursts, and never spends any leisure time with the other Jew Rangers. 
Mandora eventually thinks to destroy the chamber, meaning, as I briefly spoiled in my Time Ranger video, Budai dies when his time is up, transferring his Jusoken and armor to Geki. Between all this is the fight against the setting's true big villain, I guess, Great Satan. He's the one who Bandora sold her soul to in exchange for power. The ritual to summon him requires captured children, what plan of hers doesn't, a big pillar, and lots of chanting. The bizarre part of this guy is that he's summoned twice throughout the show. The first instance requires the ritual, and he appears to mutate the monster of the week, who had already gone from this laughable form to this legitimately unnerving form, making this the single monster's third form. Great Satan itself just sort of floats and laughs unless he's somehow controlling the monster directly. The second requires an accelerated, sacrifice-free ritual, and he just floats and blast stuff. In both instances, he doesn't say a word, smirks at the camera a bit too much, and gets beaten when King Brachian gets involved to form Ultimate Daijujin. King Brachian is just a Brachiosaurus-shaped missile platform. The actual final monster is actually an enemy mecha, piloted by Bandora's undead son. Turns out a dinosaur killed him in ancient times after he destroyed one of their eggs, so the tribe queen that became Bandora swore revenge on the dinosaurs and humanity by selling her soul for power. The Guardian Beasts and the Eggs are seemingly killed, but are actually held in a pocket realm. They're eventually saved, Big Boom, Great Satan and the Kid are destroyed, the Bandora Gang is imprisoned in another jar and yeeted out into space. The Eggs hatch, and the baby dinosaurs are given to a group of children as the Jew Rangers and Barza ascend into heaven. Well, it's not the worst show I've seen send the heroes into heaven, at least. Now, if it looks like I've jumped several episodes between those two recaps, it's because I did. There is a lot of filler in this show, and most of them suffer from the writing problems I talked about earlier. I realize filler is standard for television, Sentai especially, but as I mentioned earlier, filler can be used to tell the audience more about the characters, something G Ranger just doesn't do very often. Remember, Time Ranger had even more filler in the front half of its series, yet you got to know who the Time Rangers were. We haven't covered it yet, but Decker Ranger doesn't even have a traditional plot structure to the last leg of the series, yet every episode, even the silly ones, focus on the personalities of the Decker Rangers. Hell, even Cure Uger, though is maligned for giving Daigo the lion's share of screen time, gives plenty of focus episodes to the other Cure Ugers. Without filler, you get train wrecks like early Neo Saban Power Rangers, where it's all fights and new power-ups all the time with no character growth at all. But if you're going to have filler, you better have a good reason to stop the plot to have it. That's not to say it's all bad. I can pick out quite a few episodes where either the Kid of the Week was competent, the Jew Rangers take center stage for once, or the plot is just silly enough to be enjoyable. Geki's the standard hero, calling the shots. Despite this, he seems to be the most naive of the group, always figuring that there's a graceful solution out of every problem where everyone wins, which bites him in the ass when he has to make some tough calls. This is most prevalent during battles against his brother, where he can't bring himself to fight his own family, so the revenge-filled Brudai triumphs over him until he steals himself. He's particularly weak to hostage situations, somehow believing that giving in to the villain's demands will mean they'll let the hostage go. Guess how it actually goes most of the time. Goshi is reportedly the wise one who occasionally tries to get the team to slow down and think before acting. In an early episode of Sabas, he had a personal vendetta against Bandora for killing his sister, but this is never elaborated on after that. It could have been a weakness in his personality where he'd be calm and collected most of the time, but if he sees Bandora in person, he just loses it, but no, why would we want personal investment? Dan and Boy are more or less the same character, being less mature than the others and winding up in trouble themselves a lot of the time. Hell, even their weapons are similar, at least when Dan's lance is separated. Their tribes also have the least backstory and history mentioned, so they seem to be just there to fill out the team. The difference is stated to be that Dan is the warrior of courage, while Boy is the warrior of hope, but functionally, they're the same character. Despite Goshi supposedly being the brains of the group, Mei seems to be the most clever, usually having some of the more out-of-the-box plans. Her first Focus episode teaches her to face her fears head-on and get the job done, making her one of the only characters to have a real arc. Too bad it required us to hear one of the worst Tascate storms on the show. She's also the only one to modify her appearance throughout the show, often changing her hair. I've talked about most of Budai's role earlier, but he continues to change after his face turn. He first keeps his candle condition a secret from the rest of the team to spare Geki the suffering such knowledge would bring. This starts interfering with his ability to even show up and summon Dragon Caesar. A recurring nightmare he has shortly before his death pushes him to protect a kid who's also destined for death, teaching him what it truly means to lay down one's life for the safety of others. Barza doesn't do a whole lot of mentoring, mostly reading out the literal story bible, acting more as a mission control of sorts. He'll occasionally appear on the battlefield with a spell to get the Jew Rangers out of a bind, but he's mostly in charge of research. 
The Mecha are sentient this season, with Daijujin being the incarnation of the tribal god Daijujin. He and his component guardian beasts believe in victory at any cost, often disregarding civilians and generally being a dick to the Jew Rangers at times. Dragon Caesar has a personality without even saying a word. He is visibly depressed after Budai's passing, hesitant to answer to his new master, Geki. The suit acting in that episode was quite good considering how stiff the suit is, even compared to other mecha. King Brachian is mostly treated as an extension of Daijujin, so he acts the same way. A boneheaded decision made toward the end of the show is that once the Jew Rangers reclaim the dinosaur eggs, they store them inside King Brachian. The one beast called in when the battle is going so badly that the maximum amount of armor and firepower is needed, instead of the relative safety of the Jew Rangers base, which is never attacked once. Guess what ends up happening one episode before the finale? The villains, while entertaining to watch, don't have much depth to them. Bandora became somewhat tragic towards the end with the story of her lost son. Said son, Kai, was resurrected by Great Satan and thus refused his mother's embrace until the final battle. Bandora loses her powers after crying over his demise. She's otherwise petty, evil, and oddly jovial given the number of dances that occur. She seems to legitimately enjoy the company of her generals, but isn't above chewing them out for their failures. Fun fact, Rita Repulsa's headaches originate from Bandora. It wasn't made up in the dub. Toadpat and Buckback are a comedic duo that eventually fall out of use in the second half of the show. They do occasionally sneak behind Bandora's back to try out their own plans, which vary in success rate. Griforzor isn't able to speak for the first quarter of the show or so, only regaining the ability shortly after his femme fatale wife, Lammy, joins the gang. He's strangely articulate and well-spoken. Overall, I give Kyoryu Sentai Jiu Ranger a 5 out of 10. This is unfortunately an incredibly dull show that buckles underneath his Kid of the Week plots and paper-thin characters, only saved from complete mediocrity by Budai and the choreography. I'd say watch the first arcs and Budai stuff as a mecha battle, but having to recommend skipping anything speaks to the show's myriad failings. It's a waste of great designs and decent world building, drowned under a sea of a million task it is, with only one or two victims having the common courtesy of throwing a good aside at the end. God, I wish someone would have just take the fight footage and recontextualize it into a better story. Yeah, we're back at this question now. What about Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Well, the fact that it's the only older season still on Netflix helps matters. I'll get to it, but I might have to start doing the whole Zordon era preceded by their companion Sentai in order. We'll see. A lot of the time, comparing Zordon era Power Rangers with Sentai is like comparing apples to oranges. As for Jiu Ranger, you've got the box sets, Amazon Prime, some other streaming services, and most curiously, Shot Factory's website for free. Be warned though, the videos on the site have what appear to be fade outs for ad breaks, with no ads at least on my end, and occasional skipping. So that's it for me for now. What do you guys think? Have you seen Jiu Ranger? Do you hear Taskate in your nightmares like I do? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, leave a like and subscribe for more reviews of anime, video games, movies, and tokusatsu. Also hit that bell icon so you know exactly when a new video comes out. And yes, more videos are going to be coming out. I have a lot of cool plans for you guys. And share this video with someone that might find it helpful. Thanks for watching. This is Brian from MechBlade Studios, signing off. <laughs>